Hi there. In this presentation, we will be covering acute coronary syndrome, better known as ACS, and looking at the pathophysiology of unstable angina, ST elevated myocardial infarction, and non ST elevated myocardial infarction, all of which make up ACS. Okay, by the end of this presentation, hopefully, you will understand. Um, the pathophysiology and what makes up ACS, the different conditions covered in that, the clinical features um, and how to differentiate between them. We'll quickly look at some ECGs but this, if you want to investigate these further then please do so in your own time. Uh, we'll look at the short and long-term management of ACS and then finish off with a case study which you'll complete outside this PowerPoint presentation. Here in this slide we can see the formation of plaques um, or atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process which predisposes individuals to ACS. Um, it's actually a complex cellular process involving lipids, macrophages and smooth muscle. Um, so there's a few steps to plaque formation and subsequent thrombosis. So step one, uh, we can see at the beginning, so you would get some form of endothelial dysfunction or injury which causes an inflammatory response. And the body's mechanism, um, if it's unable to heal that rupture, um, it leads to incomplete healing and that can potentially lead to the accumulation of low density lipid proteins which you might know by LDLs when you've been doing your studies. Um, the second step in response to LDLs or these irritants, endothelial cells, so your body attracts the macrophages which come along and engulf up the LDLs to form a fatty streak which is an always great um, and then this can lead to, in step three, if there's continued inflammation, this leads to a smooth muscle migration, which forms a fibrous cap on top of these fatty streaks. So together with a the fatty streak, they develop into a atheroma. Um, and sometimes these atheromas may rupture, causing platelet aggregation where they have ruptured and subsequently a thrombus, which we can see at the end here. Um, and a thrombus may occlude or severely narrow the vessel. Um, and also you may know that a thrombus may break off and travel to another organ, such as the lungs and PE, or potentially, uh, similarly if this was in the leg, something like a DVT. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've already looked a little about um, what happens in the injury, migration of macrophages, LDLs and subsequent plaque formation. So ACS is a leading cause of death globally, and as we've seen, ultimately the result of an obstruction of the coronary arteries um, caused by an atherosclerotic plaque. So platelet aggregation and subsequent clot blocks the artery. The extent and the location of the blockage and resulting damage to the heart or the myocardium determine the extent and severity of the MI. There are two pathways through which arterial clots are formed, so two mechanisms. The first being the activation of the platelets and the second the generation of thrombin by coagulation factors. And ultimately those two pathways um, or how drugs have been developed to treat ACS. Hopefully in this slide these symptoms are quite familiar with yourself when thinking about a patient who may present um, but obviously a differential diagnosis is important because there are crossover in these symptoms to other conditions. It's important not to forget the rest of the history, especially the past medical history. So is there any family history of heart problems, especially in a first degree relative 
who maybe had a heart attack or a fatal heart attack under the age of 60 is quite a high risk factor. What drugs is the patient taking? Or are they taking any illicit drugs as well is important. Um, possible allergies they may have. Um, socially, what, you know, how long have these symptoms been going on for? Um, what can they normally manage day to day? Do they normally have breathlessness? As it's one of the main common symptoms, feeling like they're going to die and not being able to breathe. Um, so obviously, often patients will present with a range of these symptoms, but it may be chest pain, chest pain that radiates down the left arm or across the jaw. They will be sweaty and clammy. Um, so if you would like to learn more about this, you can do it in your own time. We'll also cover it in the case study at the end of this presentation. Here we can see the difference with stable angina, which does not make up the syndrome of ACS. Um, so often a uh, stable angina will, will be resolving, um, often after having to use their GTN spray. Um, we often give patients information about how often they can use the GTN spray. Um, so the first time, wait five to ten minutes if the pain is continuing to use again. And if the pain is unresolving, then to phone 999, as it could be unstable angina at that point. Um, so typically, the stable angina pain will last less than 20 minutes. It may resolve by stopping doing what has precipitated the pain in the first place. Okay, so potentially this patient may or may not be suffering from a myocardial infarction, so it's important to do a thorough um, history taking along with an examination of vital signs such as blood pressure, pulse, respiration rate. Um, often in the GP practice they'll also have access to 12 lead ECGs, uh, which can often be used as an important diagnostic tool. So looking at some of the other symptoms, it, it's sometimes good to follow, something which we've looked at previously in the literature around the mnemonic Socrates, low develop for pain, it does work well in this situation and gives you a good thorough in-depth um, detailed summary of what the patient has been doing as a lead up to this chest pain, especially has there been any history previously of any chest pain problems. Um, it is also worth saying here that sometimes patients can suffer from a silent MI. This is typically seen in elderly and diabetic patients and they often won't have symptoms. Okay, here we can see the differences between un unstable angina, and STEMI and STEMI. Um, with Unstable angina, we have, so troponin is a cardiac enzyme, which would be normal after testing, often in hospital. You will do this on presentation, and then it's six hours after that first test to see if there is a change in troponin, um, as it's a cardiac enzyme which released when there's been damage to the um, myocardium. In NSTEMI and STEMI, they're both raised, so that wouldn't uh, differentiate between the two. But you can see then in an ECG, um, often with an NSTEMI, you will get in the ST waves, you'll get a depression. But for STEMI, as the name dictates, you get ST elevation. There are other some differences, and some you can see there are dependent on time and evolve over time. So repeating an ECG is sometimes done also as the patient's an inpatient. This slide shows some of the subtle differences in the waves of an ECG reading. Uh, if you would like to, you can do your own literature research into this, but this is as much detail as we'll be covering on this slide and the following slide.
Sometimes for very acutely unwell patients um, within the hospital setting, we use the ABCD approach. And this method is to enable rapid assessment of the patient at the bedside. It is designed to provide initial management of life-threatening conditions in order of priority and the priority being to keep the patient alive and I'm focusing on improvement rather than a diagnosis at that point. Okay, this is on initial management of ACS which could be done outside the hospital in the first presentation if there is access to the equipment or drugs. So morphine is given as an analgesic and to relieve anxiety and along with oxygen which is used to maintain patient saturation levels and improve the oxygen delivery to the myocardium. Uh, these have the effect of reducing the adrenaline response and subsequently reducing the heart rate and blood pressure which helps to improve the oxygen supply to the myocardium so it will reduce the oxygen demand that the patient's currently experiencing and symptoms like breathlessness should be hopefully uh, relieved. Nitrates are also given to relieve the discomfort or the chest pain. Uh, while this could be done outside the hospital if possible and heart attack was suspected, aspirin should be given as soon as possible to inhibit the further extension of the thrombus. A STEMI will often be different to an end STEMI and unstable angina in that its presentation chest pain can be quite rapid where the other two can be slightly slower to evolve over 24 to 72 hours and the management between an STEMI and the others is slightly different so it's really important and often they will present quickly is to consider reperfusion um, and the preferred way of doing that at the moment is through primary PCI although this is only delivered at certain hospitals so it's often about access to that if there was an access to PCI then thrombolysis may be considered. Um, I won't go into any more detail but please read the further reading from the pharmaceutical journal at the end of this PowerPoint. So the initial management of UA and NSTEMI slightly different from STEMI and it's generally guided uh, by the GRACE score which you can see on the next page and is what clinicians use. Um, so dependent on where the patient falls, if they are high risk, um, they should have an angiogram within 72 hours and this is really to see whether they're appropriate for uh, cardiac stenting, which would be the preference. So stenting such as cabbage, so coronary artery bypass graft. Um, in the case, so that's within 72 hours, um, if the patient can't access an angiogram within 24 hours, um, they should be put on Fundaparnox, which is a low molecular weight heparin, and that should be used and continued uh, for up to 48 hours after the last time the patient has had chest pain. Um, you can see there, all patients will have DAP therapy as well. Um, and sometimes patients are given IV nitrates to relieve the chest pain along with a beta blocker for that cardiac protection. Okay, so why do we actually use uh, these specific medicines um, in the longer term management after a myocardial infarction and stable angina? So they have been shown evidence to reduce mortality, reduce the risk of having another MI, or reduce the risk of further complications caused by someone who has already had an MI. So beta blockers uh, work to restore the oxygen demand balance. Sometimes we say it's like giving the heart a hug. They work by making the heart beat slower uh, with a reduced force, thereby reducing cardiac output. Um, and this reduces the oxygen demand because the muscles are not having to work as hard. So this makes things a little easier all round in the heart. Um, anticoagulants, so both aspirin and clopidogrel um, are obviously antiplatelet effects and they work by reducing the 
formation of more blood clots uh, platelet aggregation by blocking the clotting cascade through their action. Uh, statins reduce blood cholesterol and we've seen LDLs make up uh, plaque formation within them uh, so this reduces the risk of formation of further plaques. Um, ACE inhibitors, so firstly they're used in hypertension so they reduce blood pressure but they've been evidence to show that they can reduce the negative structural changes so there's a bit of structural remodeling uh, that they can do following um, a myocardial infarction. Uh, nitrates may be used in unstable angina as they dilate the blood vessels and help the improved blood flow. Uh, for more information on the acute and long-term management, you can access the Khan Academy and Heart Attack Medicines. Please now work through the case study of Mr. FB, uh, which you will find just on Blackboard uh, following this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.